Since it's uh, Child Dedication Sunday, I should mention that Anton, our favorite uh, worship leader here, is uh, not here because he, and well, actually Marcy had the baby, but he was part of it. They have a new baby boy, Arlo Ishum Campare. So congratulations to the Campare family on their birth of their son. You'll see, get to meet them later, I'm sure. Uh, let's pray once more and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we've, we've come here and we've been singing your praises. We've participated as a church family in the celebration of raising children. And now, as your children, we're asking you to speak to us through your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a kid, uh, we sang a lot of uh, hymns in the church I grew up in. And I love hymns now, but I'll be honest, when I was a kid, I didn't like them so much. I tuned it out, I rolled my eyes, I didn't really pay attention, and I, and I regret that. Um, uh, now I love hymns, and, I, and I, I sing them all the time, and I listen to them, I don't sing them, well, sometimes, to myself, not with all of you around, but I listen to them. Um, and I love the rich theology in many of the old hymns. But there was one hymn we used to sing that always stuck with me. I thought about it all the time. And I thought about it many times since. I didn't always understand it, but it's, you know how certain songs sort of stay in your head? I don't mean the silly tunes from your childhood. I mean the meaning of the song and you ponder it. And that was the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And if you know this one? I can remember some of the ladies in the church I grew up in singing it. And there's a couple lines in there. What a friend we have in Jesus, right? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And I'll be honest, uh, it took me many years before I really understood what it meant to have a friendship with Jesus. And it wasn't until I was in college that I began to really discover what that meant. And it took me years after that to understand what, is, what does it mean to bring everything to him in prayer. In fact, quite frankly, I'm still learning what that means. Maybe you are as well. It would be um, prayer, 80% of Americans, American adults, not just church-going Americans, but 80% of American adults say they pray. Even those who are marked irreligious or no religion say they pray. I often wonder, like, to whom are they concerned? Like, who's the object of their prayers? That, that's a, a, a pretty shocking statistic. The most common motivation for prayer, can you guess? Like, what's the most common reason people give for why they pray? Crisis, need, trouble? Yeah, that's, in the, that's on the list. Number one, just think three days ago, or four days ago, <laughs> gratitude. Most people, the most common reason given for prayer is an expression of thanks and gratitude for the blessings of life. Seems appropriate. I remember with my youngest son, Ben, when he was a little guy at bedtime, uh, tucking him in and doing prayers, you know. And I would pray, and then he would pray, and then and, and we would have like a back and forth uh, a little routine. And when he was little, like he couldn't remember what to pray for. So he'd fold his hands and he started thanking God for whatever he could think of. I mean, everything. And then when he ran out of things to thank God for, I, I was, you know, I was watching him and he would, he would peek, open his eyes, start looking around the room. Thank you for my army men and thank you for bionicles and thank you for my Legos and thank you for trucks and thank you for like all the things he could see. He just thanked God for whatever he could see, right? Which, and I remember telling him like, Ben, you can do more than just thank God. I mean, that's a good place to start, especially if you're seven years old. But there's, there's more to prayer than just a thank you list. It's not just a spiritual thank you card to God. Although that's certainly part of it. Um, the Bible is full of prayers from front to back. People crying out to God, making requests of God, thanking God, praising God, asking God hard questions. There's instructions on prayer, teaching about prayer, models for prayer. The Bible's full of prayers. You could, if you want to read more, you could get Herbert Lockyer's book, All the Prayers of the Bible. It's a great read, a great study. In fact, in the new year, we're going to do a four-part series on the prayers of the Apostle Paul, praying with Paul. Learning to pray from the Apostle Paul together in, in the new year. But for all of this, I'm going to guess most of you, like me, sometimes struggle with prayer. Anybody? Anybody feel like, I, 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 I don't pray the way I want to or feel like I should. And the people that I admire spiritually seem to have a richer, more vital prayer life than I do. I feel that way sometimes. We, we don't feel like it comes easy to us. You wonder if you're praying to the wall. Is God really there? You wonder if you're doing it wrong. Am I getting the words right? We sense there's something more for us, but we're not sure quite how to get it. Well, that's you. You're not alone. And, uh, by the way, James concludes his letter to these Jewish believers, Jewish converts to faith in Jesus in the first century Roman world, with a section on the power and purpose of prayer, what prayer really is all about. So, if you have your Bible, you can follow along with me or read uh, on the screen. 
James chapter 5, verses 13 through the end of the chapter, verse 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, James covers a lot of ground in this passage. Uh, prayers all over this section. It's mentioned in every one of the first uh, five verses of this passage. Uh, back in chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, James calls us to patient endurance. And he's telling us that being patient is not passive. It's not just sitting around doing nothing, hoping God figures it out. It's active waiting. And the way we patiently wait is through prayer. That's the way we actively endure, is in prayer. That's our activity. Now, sometimes we may be tempted, and I've, I've struggled with this. You might be tempted to think, well, prayer is kind of a last resort. Like if I've exhausted all my other options and I don't know where else to turn, I cry out to God and pray. That's not how James sees it or the writers of the New Testament. Or maybe you have thought at times like, I know I should pray, but I feel like I'm wasting time, and so I should do something as if prayer isn't doing something. That's not at all how the authors of the New Testament see prayer, and certainly not James, and certainly not how Jesus sees it either. If there's a theme in this passage on prayer that James sort of covers all kinds of ground, I think it's this. It's a theme of restoration, a prayer for restoration, the prayer of restoration. We're going to walk through the different kinds of restoration James shows us here. Because prayer restores us to right relationship with God, right relationship with one another. It restores us, it can restore us physically and spiritually through forgiveness and bring us back those who have wandered. Notice the first thing James says, he asks a rhetorical question. Is anyone among you suffering? Anybody suffering? Okay, it's not rhetorical. Anybody suffering? Anybody suffered? And the word uh, suffering there is the word kakopatheo. It means um, like it, uh, enduring hardship. It doesn't just mean physical suffering. It means going through a hard time, a difficult situation that's painful physically, emotionally, psychologically. Anybody relate to that? And often they're linked, aren't they? Physical pain of someone of yourself or someone you love brings you to spiritual or emotional pain. James says, if that's you, what should you do? Well, you can probably guess, right? What should you do? Pray. I don't even have to ask that question. I know many of you are. I got an email, a text, excuse me, from a dear, dear friend, uh, Jenny Caterer. Many of you know her, who lost her father, uh, passed away on, on his 61st wedding anniversary on Thanksgiving morning. They took him off life support. Going through a hard time. I told her that I'd be praying for her. And by the way, that's not just the Christian way of saying, okay, see you later. I'll be praying for you. I'll be interceding for you. I'll be lifting you up before the Father to give you comfort and mercy and peace and the confidence of knowing that your, fa your Father is with his Heavenly Father now. This is the prayer of restoration in hard times. According to James, the right response in hard times is pray. But notice James doesn't tell us exactly what to pray. He just says, is any of you suffering or in trouble, what should you do? Pray. Then he moves on to good times. We'll get to that in a minute. He doesn't say what you should pray. Maybe he has in mind the, the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of his, his brother, our Lord Jesus, our Father who art in heaven. Pray that. Certainly a good thing to pray at all times. But he doesn't say. Maybe he intends us to, to pray that some of the Psalms of Lament, the Psalms that they give us words to cry out to God in, in struggle. Maybe, but he doesn't specify. He doesn't tell us what to pray. I think many of us think, oh, I know what I should pray in hard times. Lord, get me out of this. Lord, make it stop. Lord, bring an end to this. And, the, and, and of course, we can and should pray for deliverance and pray for an end to whatever suffering we're facing. 
But if you read through the New Testament authors, particularly the Apostle Paul, you'll notice something. Paul almost never prays for the relieving of immediate circumstances for other people. He prays for the presence of God, the knowledge of the love of God, the mercy and, and work of the Spirit of God in the midst of those circumstances. Now again, it's not wrong to pray, Lord, bring an end to this. But the greater, deeper prayer, I think, is Lord, be with me. Lord, teach me. Lord, strengthen me in this. Not just get me out of it, but have your way in it. This is the first thing I think all of us want to pray. Most of the prayers in the Bible we see are this way. God, uh, bring in your... And honestly, when I've been with people who have really suffered or really going through difficult things, sometimes the best you can do is just bring your pain to the Lord. Sometimes all you can manage is just to, just to tell God that it hurts, that, it's, that you're struggling, and that's enough. That prayer is enough. Look at verse 13 one more time. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. We just saw that part. Suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. The word cheerful is an interesting Greek word. It means um, uh, joyful, in good spirits, or happy. This is the prayer of restoration in good times. So are you suffering? Are you going through a hard time? Pray. Are you cheerful and happy and everything's good? Sing praise. Now maybe you're thinking, prayer of restoration in good times. Like if I'm happy and I'm full of joy and everything's going well, why do I need to pray to be restored? Like I don't want this to end. This is a good thing. I mean, pray that God ends the suffering but keeps things good. I've noticed something as a pastor. I've been, I've been in pastoral ministry for well over 25 years. And I've noticed that hard times, suffering, pain, can cause people to drift from God. It can harden our hearts. It can cause people to question God and drift out, out of connection with him and with his people. But just as often, even more frequently, it, it softens us. The same sun that hardens clay, right, melts wax. It can soften our hearts. It can cause us to cry out for mercy and, and, and draw near to people who can comfort us. My experience is what causes people to drift from God most often is not suffering. It's comfort. It's ease. It's security. It's when all is going right. It's when everything's good. And we start to buy the lie subtly that I'm fine as I am. I don't need anything really from God. And I give him lip service, but I'm not connected to him. Recently, I read, I read a book called The Great Dechurching, uh, written by two, two sociologists, Christian sociologists, Michael Graham and Jim Davis. They did a study of... Uh, over the last 25 years, 40 million Americans have stopped attending church regularly by their own self-reporting. That's a huge number. And 30 million of the 40 million, they did a whole deep dive, a lot of it's technical uh, statistical analysis, but 30 million estimate of the 40 million, like there's some that have stopped attending because of some pain, some hurt the church caused them, some uh, question that they felt they couldn't reconcile with their faith, some acute issue. But those are rare, statistically speaking. We think that's the main number. Do you know why most of people of those 40 million that have stopped attending the last 25 years stopped? They just drifted. They just got out of the habit. They just stopped kind of, you know, once a week, then once every couple of weeks, then once a month, then, you know, then Christmas and Easter, and then ah. Uh, and they just stopped. And I don't mean necessarily that going to church is the only measure of your connection to God, but there is a connection. So why does James say, in good times, sing songs of praise? To teach your heart that all is, it. remember what he says in, in James chapter 1? Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Don't be deceived. Everything is a gift of God. And so when you're, when you're rejoicing and cheerful and everything's good, sing songs of praise. Remind your heart of who is the giver and where your true joy is found, lest you drift. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks. He gives us this threefold sort of measure of the spirit-filled Christian in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ for you. I love this, this part here. Rejoice, pray, 
give thanks. Like, you're going to boil down God's will for you? You want a, you want a, you want a, you want a good measure of how, how to stay connected to God and not drift? Rejoice, pray, and give thanks regularly, continually. Now, next, James moves to a different kind of prayer for restoration, the prayer of restoration in sickness. The prayer of restoration. How many of you have ever prayed for someone who was sick or facing a dire diagnosis? Anybody? Every, every hand should be up or you're just not paying attention this morning, right? We all have. And how many of us have also experienced the pain of watching that person we pray for continue to suffer, waiting for God to answer, to heal? It's a prayer we've all prayed. Look at verses 14 through 15 of James chapter 5. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Now, if you're paying attention, James is connecting some things here that are a little bit confusing. He's connecting physical healing of sickness with forgiveness of sins. And it's not immediately clear what he's talking about. And this passage, quite frankly, is often misquoted, misunderstood, and misapplied. First of all, petitionary prayer does pose a problem. Petitionary prayer, right? Making requests to God, asking God to answer, particularly to relieve the suffering, to take away the cancer, to restore someone to health. That poses a bit of a theological, sometimes even existential problem. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts this in an essay called The World's Last Night. Petitionary prayer is nonetheless both allowed and commanded to us. Right in the Lord's Prayer, right? Give us our daily bread. And no doubt it raises a theoretical problem. Can we believe that God ever really modifies his action in response to the suggestions of men or women? God, said Pascal, he's quoting Blaise Pascal there, instituted prayer in order to lend his creatures the dignity of causality. This is a brilliant line. God instituted prayer to give us the dignity of causality and joining him in and what he's doing. But not only prayer, whenever we act at all, he lends us that dignity. You hear what he's saying? God in his sovereign mercy and, and grace gives us causality even in our actions. Why should anything we do make any difference at all if God didn't ordain it? It's not really stranger nor less strange that my prayer should affect the course of events that my other actions should do so. They have not advised or changed God's mind, that is, his overall purpose. But that purpose will be realized in different ways according to the actions, including the prayers of his creatures. Lewis is pondering the mystery that we all struggle with, even if we don't put it quite as eloquently as he does. Does it make a difference? Does prayer change anything? Does God hear? Does he do anything about this? Or am I just sort of making myself feel good? Well, that's not how James saw it. And it's certainly not how Jesus sees it. The prayer of restoration does, is effective. The point James is making is to pray in community. Now, he says some things about elders and oil that are a little bit specific. Let me tell you what he's not saying, first of all, here in this passage. He's not talking about a special gift or office of healing. We go back one slide. He's not talking about some office of healing. Like some of you have seen like uh, faith healers, right, or, or t TV healers or preachers on YouTube that are, that are, and they're always like healing people by making a leg grow a little bit longer. Like there's, a, like there's an epidemic of short legs in the world. None of these healers ever go into the cancer ward and just wipe it all out and heal everybody. It's always this little strange kind of healings, right? And, and the healing is always somebody up front saying, oh, I, I sense somebody has this ailment. But James is saying, if you are sick, you call the elders. It works the other way around. You call, and he doesn't mean the elders meaning those that have a special magical power of healing. He means bring the church, bring the community, the family of God around you to pray for you when you're sick. That's what he's saying. And the oil isn't magic, has no healing powers. The, the power of, the, when he says the prayer of faith, this phrase in the prayer of faith, it, it doesn't mean if you have enough faith, you'll be healed. And if you don't have enough faith, you won't be. I've heard people talk that way and teach that. That is a cruel heresy to people. Over and over to the Scripture's witnesses, the power of faith for the believer is not in how much you have, but in the, the object of your faith, the one in whom you have faith, in the power of Jesus. That's why he says a mustard seed, right? 
So it's not how much faith you have. It's not some magic potion or uh, some person that has the magic power of healing. He's simply saying, if you're sick, your first reaction ought to be to cry out to God and call the family of God together around you. Come pray for me. The oil is symbolic. By the way, it's the only passage in the New Testament that talks about anointing with oil. And people get healed all throughout the Gospels without any anointing of oil. So it's not a command. It's a symbolic meaning. We're, we're, we're symbolically putting the blessing of God on this person. So my point is, it's not wrong to anoint with oil, but it's not required for healing. I hope we, we get that part right. The prayer of faith is a request to God that comes from a genuine devotion to God and a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. The same is true later when he talks about the prayer of the righteous person. Those are, syn those are synonym phrases. James is here connecting the forgiveness of sin with the healing of sickness at the, at the end of this verse. Do you see that? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Save. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Now, the Bible does not teach the law of karma. That you get sick for your sin. You suffer physically for the wrongdoing on earth. Lots of other world religions have some version of that, but that's nowhere in the Bible. But it does connect physical suffering with spiritual suffering and sin. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11, when the wealthy Christians in the city of Corinth are turning the Lord's Supper into sort of a drunken banquet, they're, they're completely abusing it. Paul writes to them and says, if you eat and drink in an unworthy manner, you eat and drink judgment on yourself, and that's why some of you are getting sick. There is a connection to be made. Jesus himself says to the paralyzed man in Matthew chapter 9. Remember this story in Matthew 9? The, paraly the paralytic, he, the man's lying there on the mat, and Jesus said, I tell you, your sins are forgiven. Which is not exactly why his friends brought him there. They wanted him to walk. But he's like, okay, thank you. you know, I don't know what he said. You know? and, the, and the teachers of the law are watching this, and they're saying, who does this guy think he is? And then Jesus says, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I tell you, get up and walk. What's he saying? The point of the physical healing is the deeper spiritual healing. Always. Pastor Roger Kreitz, who died of cancer a long time ago, a member of our church, dear friend to many of us, he used to always say in his cancer diagnosis, I may not be cured, but I was healed a long time ago. I love that. I may not be cured. I'm praying for a cure. I want to be cured. I want to see my grandchildren grow up. I may not be, but I was healed, forgiven, restored, set free a long time ago. That's, I think, what James is getting at here. This brings us to the prayer of restoration in sin. The prayer of restoration in sin. Confession here, he talks about confessing our sins to one another. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word confession. Maybe some of you grew up in the Catholic tradition and you think about a, a confessional with a priest and a confessional booth. Maybe some of you think about like a, a public confession, like an inquisition. You've got to stand up and, and air your dirty laundry. Neither of those are what the New Testament has in mind, or what James is talking about here. Look at verse 16. Therefore, so therefore what? Therefore, since you're to be a praying people who pray in good times and in hard times. In other words, Christians are those who turn hard times into prayers and good times into songs of praise. Since you're a praying people, what should you do? Pray for each other when you're sick and confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Often quoted verse. Let's talk about what it really means. James connects the forgiveness here of sin with our spiritual healing. It says to each other, hearing, confession, and praying for mercy and forgiveness is a ministry that belongs to the family of God. Only Christ forgives sins, but you and I have the, 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 the God-given privilege of hearing one another's confession and reminding each other of what is true in Christ. In John chapter 20, Jesus it tells us that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you ever wonder what that was like? Jesus, <sighs> like what did Jesus' breath smell like? Maybe that's a weird question. Like he breathes on them, the Spirit. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then his next words are, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. That sounds kind of obvious. If I don't forgive you, I haven't forgiven you. What does he mean? 
He's saying, you and we, one another, in Christ's place, have the beautiful responsibility and privilege of reminding each other we're forgiven when we sin. And something happens when we do that publicly. I don't mean publicly like you come up up here and have to say it on the microphone. I mean when you sit with a brother or sister and confess. I'm going to ask a question to you that Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked in his book Life Together. When you have really screwed up, I mean something you, you really don't want anyone else to know about and you're ashamed of, which is easier for you? To go into your room, close the door, and just confess to God privately. Just deal with it, just you and God. Or to sit in a circle of eight to ten brothers and sisters in Christ and tell them what's, what you did. How many of you say, I prefer to handle that alone, thank you? Anybody? No. Bonhoeffer's question is, why? Why do we think it's easier to sit alone before a holy God who we sinned against than in a circle of fellow sinners also saved by grace who can remind us? It's because we're in danger of what he calls self-forgiveness. Here's Bonhoeffer again. In confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of the heart. A man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer alone with himself, and he experiences the presence of God and the reality of the other person. I think he's dead on in what James is saying to us here. He's not talking about salvation. When you trust in the Lord Jesus, your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. But we all wander. We all screw up. We all fail to live up to the measure of what God has called us to. And when that happens, we need to be restored. We need to be brought back into right relationship, be given the freedom, and that happens through the power of confession and praying for each other. This is what John writes in 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, that means keep the sin to ourselves. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Notice what he says. If we walk in the light, as Christ in the light, we not just fellowship with God, but fellowship with who? One another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins. In fact, let's read this last sentence together. Ready? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a great promise. Now, you're forgiven if you're in Christ, but you're not walking in freedom. You're not walking in, in liberty and in restoration and in joy and connection to, the, to God through faith in Christ if you're not confessing sin. If you're not dealing with it. If you're not bringing it to light and let God deal with it. That's what he's talking about. He is faithful and just. He will forgive. He will restore. Look at verses 17 through 18. We don't have time now because I've been long-winded. But um, this, this whole part about Elijah, let me just put it this way. It's a mistake to read this as if like it's some magic formula. Like Elijah prayed for rain and prayed for a drought, and it was like a magic trick he did just to show up how, how powerful his prayers were. The whole context of this, of, of James loves to quote Old Testament examples. He does it with Job, he does it with Abraham, he does it with Moses, and now here he does it with Elijah. The whole context is Elijah is speaking the very words of God, meaning the people of God had wandered away from God collectively. They rejected him. And this prayer for drought and rain is God's judgment and then restoration of his people. My point is James brings this up because the whole context here is about restoring the people of God to relationship with God, bringing them back into relationship with God. That's what his prayer is about, really. That's why he cites it. In 1 Kings 8, 18, uh, Elijah says, how long will you waver between God and Baal? Remember this question? Well, what does James say in two different places, in chapter 1 and chapter 4, about being double-minded? He's quoting this to say, because it's a prayer of restoration. 
a prayer of restoration when you're facing hard times, a prayer of re restoration through praise when you're, everything's going well, a prayer of restoration when you're sick or someone you love is sick, a prayer of restoration when you're in sin, and then lastly, a prayer of restoration when you wander. When people wander from the truth, he says. Look at verses 19 through 20. My brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and recover a multitude of sins. How, how do you bring someone back? Well, you go to their house, you grab them by the back of their collar, and you drag them to church. That's what I do. <laughs> now, how do you bring them back? Really, it's not a trick question. And you should be, you should, if you're not, you should get this one. How would you begin to bring a brother or sister who has wandered back? Let's back up and ask, do you know anybody who's wandered? Have you ever wandered? What does wandering mean? Drifted? Out of connection with the family of God? Drifted away from the one you, you profess to believe who is your life? I have. You know how I've been brought back? Prayer. People praying for me. Mostly my mother, but lots of other people too. How would you begin to bring back someone who's wandering? prayer. Prayer that God would restore them. That he would convict them. That he would open their eyes. And wandering happens little by little, right? It's not the conscious decision, I'm out. It's just drift. And it looks harmless and innocent, but it isn't. But like a great example of this is those who wander to the bottom of the Grand Canyon in summer, thinking how beautiful it would be down there from the rim. And it's 30 degrees warmer at the, at the base than it is at the top. People die down there every year, have to go be rescued. Those who wander, how does God bring them back? It's not magic. It's through the prayers and the love of his people. This might seem like an odd way for James to finish his letter. But if you think about it, the whole letter of James is really written to people who are beginning to wander. They're mistreating the poor, they're cursing against each other. There's infighting going on. There's favoritism going on. Like he's writing to people who are in danger of drifting from the one they profess to have faith in. And he's calling us to do the same thing his letter is doing. Bring one another back. That's what God wants to do for us. I'll come back to that last little hymn I, I, I began with. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Are you cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, he's still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We're to be a praying people, friends. People who, who pray in difficult times. Christians turn hard times into prayers. They turn good times into songs of praise. They pray for one another when they're sick. They gather around each other and support one another. And they pursue one another in prayer when we wander. It's so easy to think the church is just something I come for me and that you're, what you do is your business. But prayer is the best gift you offer the people of God. So, let's pray. Father, we bow before you and acknowledge that all of us wander. We're prone to it. All of us struggle. And all of us drift, especially when things are comfortable. Lord, teach us by your Spirit to be people of prayer. Who our first instinct, whatever our circumstance, is to turn our hearts to you. Our knee-jerk reaction to every situation is to turn to you, Lord Jesus to praise you, to beg you for mercy, to confess to you, to cry out to you for healing, to intercede for those we love. Lord, forgive us for turning to ourselves or to the wisdom of this world. Thank you that you are always turned toward us and we can always turn to you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Christ is enough indeed. Uh, we, have, we say this every week. We have members of the prayer team who are always here in our prayer room up back praying for you and ready to pray with you. So this morning, if you're here and you'd like someone to pray with you, you feel like, yeah, James is right. I need to call people to pray. We will meet.
meet with you right in the back, and they'll pray with you and pray for you. Uh, we'd love to do that with you. Now, may you go in the grace and mercy and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory in your church and in all creation.